أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So we're at uh, Surah Al-Nasr, Surah number 110 uh, Again, this is a continuation of the previous Surah So in the previous Surah, we learned about the declaration of war And right, the Surah after that, we're learning what the fate of the believers will be that the believers will get victory. And subhanAllah, the surah right after that is the fate of the disbelievers with Surah Al-Masad and Abu Lahab. So it's a beautiful way that the surahs are sequenced in the Mus'haf. And um, you know, in this, of course, surah Al-Nasr basically means victory, right? So this is the surah of victory. And uh, so there's a lot of difference of opinion when the surah was revealed, but for the most part, it was in, in the latter part of Medina. Okay, there's differences of opinion whether this was the last surah revealed or not, but what you need to understand is the later, later part of Medina, and uh, in this surah there is a hint to the idea that there will be uh, the conquest of Mecca, so this is the su- s- s- giving a sign of the conquest of Mecca, and uh, of course good news for the, for the believers, bad news for the disbelievers. Um, and there's really amazing lessons in it, Sarah. It's a very short surah, but very, very beautiful lessons in it. So I'll try to highlight some of them, inshallah, in this limited time. Um, we also, uh, some just context about the surah. So there's different narrations. One of them is that, you know, at one point, Umar did a quiz, basically, for the Sahaba. He, he recited the surah onto them and, and asked them, what do you learn from the surah? So everyone was basically saying that, yeah, it means that we need to do Tasbih and hamd and istighfar after we gain victory. But Ibn Abbas, who was a very young boy back then, he actually said, no, this is actually a hint toward that the fact that the Prophet ﷺ is going to be dying soon. And so Umar said, you, yani, I agree with what you said, yani, you know. So in, in this surah, is in a way, Allah is telling us that the mission of the Prophet ﷺ has come to an end and therefore it's nearly... The end of his life because خلاص, the mission is done, you know. Uh, another riwayah uh, uh, is that Abu Bakr Sadiq when he heard this uh, surah, he started crying like profusely. Yani. Why? Because he also got the hint that خلاص, this means Nasr is going to come, that means Rasulullah is going to leave us very soon. And another narration. Uh, Fatma when, when she heard about the surah and the Prophet ﷺ told her about the surah, she started crying because of the departure of the Prophet ﷺ and you know, her, her being separated from him. And the Sahaba saw her crying and then moments later they saw her laughing. And so they went up to her and asked her, one moment you're crying, the other moment you're laughing, what's going on? And so she said that the Prophet ﷺ, when I started crying, he came to me and he said, you will be the first one to join me in Jannah. And so she started laughing because this was like good news for her. So at one point she was sad, but then the Prophet ﷺ gave her some good news. And it's also mentioned that you know, the wives of the Prophet ﷺ would notice that after the surah was revealed, he would do a lot more istighfar and not more, he would you know, do tasbih and tahmeed. And you know, the, istighfar, the hadith about istighfar of the Prophet a 100 times per day, it, was, it came after the surah was revealed. So you know, the Prophet ﷺ was increased his istighfar because literally Allah commands him فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ right? and do tasbih and hamd of your master and do istighfar right? so uh, the Prophet in answer to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did this much more towards the end latter part of his uh, years and, uh, and that is a beautiful lesson also that this is what the Prophet used to love doing most of the time right but um, you know, what was his job in the, what was the challenge for him in the beginning of his message? The challenge was, we know you love to do tasbih and tahmeer, but you got to go and warn them. Qum fa'andhar, right? And at night, qum al-layl, get up at night and pray and do tasbih, but in the morning what? Dhakr. Qum fa'andhar, stand up and warn. It's, your mission is not complete yet, you got to still... Keep, keep at your mission, keep doing your mission, 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 mission. But then when the mission is complete, what? Allah is telling you, okay, you know, I know you love doing a tasbih and tahmeed and istighfar, you, you love to remember me. Now that your mission is complete, now 
do what you really enjoy doing. Now you can do tasbih and tahmeed and istighfar. So that's part of the, uh, the flowing of this surah also. Um, <coughs> also, we learned that the, perf- the first part of the surah, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ When the, you know, the victory of Allah comes and the fath and the conquest comes, and you see people coming into Islam and, and multitudes, وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسِ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا This is what's happening on the outside. What's happening inside the house? فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ You, in your privacy, you need to remember your Rabb. And do istighfar. So we're getting a, like a scene. The first two ayat are a scene of the external, what's happening outside, and then the private life of the Prophet. ﷺ. And so um, we also learn from Sirah that you know the Prophet ﷺ, when, when it was Fath Mecca, conquest of Mecca, how did he enter into Mecca? He entered while in the state of sujood. He was literally prostrating, lowering his head on the camel that he was riding as he entered uh, Mecca, which is a sign of what? Of sign of humility. And this is very much unlike what people do when they gain victory nowadays in dunya, right? I mean, you know, you watch the Champions League final, you know, Barcelona wins the Champions League. What happens? There's celebration and fireworks and champagne and dancing and singing, right? And then, you know, when they go back to their countries, there's big welcoming and greeting and parades and so this is how people celebrate nowadays when it comes to victories but we're learning from this surah how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants a believer to you know celebrate after victory subhanallah it's with hamd and tasbih subhanallah and alhamdulillah and astaghfirullah and doing tawbah. And we'll, we'll talk about this inshallah when we get there, but very different way of celebration. Yani. You know, no parades, no singing, no dancing, none of that. Yani. So it's very interesting. And the Prophet understood this completely, and that's why he did sajda. So it's, it's completely in line with seerah. Um, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ Let's get into the surah. So, إِذَا actually is a device that's used in the, in the Arabic language to talk about the future. When the victory of Allah will come. إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ And جَاءَ, the word جَاءَ means to come, but it's, there's another word for جَاءَ which means أَتَى, right? إِذَا أَتَى نَصْرُ اللَّهِ What's the difference between جَاءَ and أَتَى? جَاءَ means it's a big deal. It's a, it's a heavy thing. It took a lot of effort and was, there was a lot of struggle involved in it. Okay? That's when Ja'a is used. So yes, the, the, the victory came, but there was a lot of effort in it and it, it, you know, there was big sacrifices. It was a big deal. It's a huge victory. That's what the word Ja'a refers to. And Allah here you know, associated Nasr or victory with him. Nasrullah. Like if you remember the previous uh, surahs, Naqat uh, Allahi, you know, the, the she camel of Allah, or Narullah al Muqada, right? So whenever something is associated with Allah, it's a big deal. Therefore, Ja'a was appropriately used here. But this is a grand victory, and it's Allah's victory. Nasrullahi wal Fatih. There's a lot of, lot of help that came from Allah. That's what Allah is saying here. And. Um, you know, the credit in this surah, Allah is saying the credit of Nasr goes to who? Goes to Allah, not to the Prophet. ﷺ. Therefore, Ya Rasul, humble yourself because the Nasr wasn't from you, it wasn't from the Sahaba, it was from who? From Allah, completely from Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, how do you need to react when Nasr comes from Allah? By thanking him for the Nasr, right? You need to thank, you need to be grateful. Unlike what Quraysh did, right? They weren't thankful. Here we're learning, فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ Rabbik. Thank your Rabb. Do tasbih of him. And istighfar. إِنَّهُ كَانَ tawaba. But what's really one of the beautiful lessons of the surah is um, where we look at an, another ayah in Surah Al-Saf where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that, O oh, you who believe, 
هل أدلكم على تجارة تنجيكم من عذاب أليم؟ Shall I, you know, guide you to a business deal or a transaction that will save you from a severe punishment? What's that deal? تؤمنون بالله ورسوله. You believe in Allah and His Messenger. وتجاهدون في سبيل الله بأموالكم وأنفسكم. And you struggle in the path of Allah with your money and with your nafs. ذلكم خير لكم إن كنتم تعلمون. That would be better for you if you only knew. Okay. What's the consequence of this? يغفر لكم ذنوبكم. He will forgive you your sins. ويدخلكم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار. And he will enter you into gardens beneath which rivers flow. ومساكن طيبة في جنات عدن. And you will have amazing, you know. Uh, Accommodation in Jannat Adnan, in the gardens of, of paradise. ذلك الفوز العظيم. That is the grand victory. Okay? Now look at what Allah says right after this. وأخرى تحبونها نصر من الله وفتح قريب. And besides that, as a secondary thing, another like sub-victory you can call it, is نصر من الله. A victory from Allah and فتح قريب. And of a very near conquest and give good news to the believers now this is uh, ayah number 10 till 13 of surah as-saf okay here nasrullah is mentioned right nasrun min allah and victory from allah is mentioned but it came as a secondary victory right what was the initial victory forgiveness yaghfir lakum dhunubikum and and jannah so what we're learning here is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is is Teaching us priorities. Because sometimes, you know, and we're living in those ages now when people get so obsessed with victory, 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 and khilafa, and, you know, sharia, law, and we need to, you know, uh, rule with sharia and with the book of Allah, and, you know, whoever doesn't, it's this and that. And there's this big movement happening all across the world where people want victory, victory, victory. Allah's saying, you're, you're running after the wrong thing. What are we supposed to run after? Forgiveness. Run after forgiveness. Nasr is secondary. And Nasr is something I'll take care of. You know? Nasr, Nasrullah. Allah will take care of the Nasr. You need to take care of what? You need to worry about your istighfar, subhanAllah. So here, uh, that's one of the beautiful lessons here. So what was the mission of the Prophet ﷺ? To cleanse the Kaaba. Right? That was the ultimate objective. Second, secondary to that was the victory itself. The so primary objective was the purification of the Kaaba, and you know that's why istighfar is mentioned in the surah to remind us of the the objective. Don't yes, Nasr of Allah came, but what's what are you supposed to get busy doing? Sabbah bihamdi rabbika wa istighfar. Focus on yourself, on purifying yourself, and you know doing istighfar and, and cleansing yourself. So. What's the difference between Nasr and Fath? Just to clarify the two. So uh, Fath is a clear-cut victory. You know, where there's no... Because uh, Nasr can be some help, you know, or maybe it was a, a very close match. You know how sometimes you have a cricket match, last run, you, know, you realize who's going to win, who's not going to win. That's Nasr, where there was... You know, competition. But Fath means what? خلاص, يعني, there's no... Everyone knows who won. The winner knows he won. The loser knows he won. Sometimes in boxing matches, this happens, right? There's no knockout. And until the end, bell, when the judges make the announcement, you don't know who won. That's Nasr, when it's a close call. But Fath has, you know, the guy knocked him out, خلاص. You know who won. Clear defeat, absolute winner and, and loser. Now, uh, of course, this surah, Surah Al-Nasr, is linked with Surah Al-Fatih, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off by saying, Inna fatahna laka fatahan mubina. And this is referring to the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. <coughs> Just to refresh you on what the Treaty of Hudaybiyah was, Sulh uh, al-Hudaybiyah, basically the believers, they were going to do Umrah. And everyone was excited and, you know, no weapons. They only had their daggers for the sacrifice. So, يعني, for the Quraysh, 
this was uh, something they didn't accept and what happened was they stopped them and they made a deal with them which was very unfair in the eyes of who? Of the believers, right? Even people like Umar got really upset that Ya Rasulullah, why are you compromising with them? We are in a higher position but the deal was in their favor. They didn't let us do Hajj this year. They didn't let us, let us um, you know, all the rules were in their favor. If someone from Mecca flees to come to Medina, what are the believers supposed to do? Return him back. I mean, this is clearly unfair. Yani. So Umar was like, Ya Rasulullah, we are in a higher position of authority. Why are we compromising in this? Yani? So Allah called this treaty Fath. You know, which is very interesting and uh, we need to understand yani, to the point, Sahaba were so upset to the point where uh, when Rasulullah told them to remove the ihram, they weren't removing. They were yani, literally disobeying, disobeying the Prophet And so Rasulullah was confused. He went into the house and you know, one of the mothers of the believers gave him advice that Ya Rasulullah, you, you shave your head and remove the ihram and inshallah they will follow and that's what he did. Yani. But uh, so it was a very interesting time of seerah. But what basically happened then was, why did Allah call this treaty Fath? Where well, Sahaba saw this as a defeat. To understand this, we need to understand how Islam started. Islam started as what? As a strange thing, right? It started as a minority group who were, you know, being kind of like, According to the eyes of the kuffar, brainwashed by Rasulullah. And they used to prevent their people, don't listen to this man, he's going to separate between you and your family, right? He's going to brainwash you, he's going to do magic to you, you're going to end up leaving your family. And so, you know, you know how like cults are seen? You know, cults are, like governments never talk with cults or minority groups or terrorist groups, right? Governments will not, never acknowledge them. And whenever you have a state and you have a minority group that's causing trouble, they would never have a press conference with them or, sh or discuss with them on a table. Why? Because they're not even acknowledged. This group is not acknowledged. There's a, they're a terrorist group or a group that's unrecognized. They don't have any sort of authority. Okay, and so this is what happened throughout the Meccan period. You know, they were just being discredited, you know, Majnoon. Sahir, the ring, you know, all this character assassination was happening in the process. Huh? They didn't want to have any discussions, any negotiations with Rasulullah in that position. And there was physical attacks and threats, and you know, if they could, they could, they would kill and torture, right? So clearly, they are not recognizing this group, this minority group, because it's still at its infancy stage. That's what happened in the Meccan period. But then. What happened when they came back after, you know, all these years? After like, you know, more than, uh, you know, ten, about 20 years of da'wah, the believers now are coming back in bigger numbers. And this time, they have no weapons with them. There's confidence. And they're coming to do hajj, yani, you know, in their ahram. And so all of a sudden, Quraysh the way Quraysh reacted to this uh, group coming back, the same group that were a minority, they weren't willing to sit on the table, now what are they doing? They're willing to sign a treaty with them. So by, by them signing a treaty with this group, Allah called it Fath. This was the victory, because finally, Quraysh have recognized that this group is now a legit group, and we acknowledge them, and although the terms are in our favor, but the bigger picture was, this was the beginning of the defeat. Because they acknowledge this as a state now. They acknowledge the Muslims as a group that they can actually negotiate with. So, hidden in that, this was, yani, this was huge news for everybody. That, wow, yani, Quraysh signed a deal with the Muslims. They recognize them as an authority now. As, you know, a, a group that's a legit group. So this, you know, in itself was, according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fathan mubina, a clear-cut victory, Allah calls it. Not just victory, clear-cut victory. So, um, and notice that there was no bloodshed in this, in this treaty, huh? So Quraysh knew that even, yani, the time for wars and that is over. We need to have a peace treaty with them, basically. 
you know, which is what some countries do nowadays, right? Peace treaties with different groups and stuff. So this, this was basically what led to the Nasr of Allah. So Allah calls it Nasrullah. And here we're learning something very important that which also Yusuf alayhi salam taught us in, in his story is that when you're in a position of authority and power and you gain victory, because you know, his brothers tried to kill him, right? But what did we learn from his story? That he forgave them. And this is primarily what happened with Rasulullah also. That for him, he didn't take advantage of that victory and this, yani, you know, kill all the disbelievers. What did he do? Pretty much this, he said the same thing Yusuf said to his people. لا تثريب عليكم اليوم You know, there's خلاص, I've forgiven you all. Of course, there was a small ex- exception to, to this where certain disbelievers were dealt with justly. But for the most part, most of Quraysh were, were left uh, forgiven. And a lot of them accepted Islam. And, you know, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ Also here it refers to the fact that this, these victories will keep coming. This was just the opening door of victory. And that we learn from, from history that after the conquest of Mecca, there was victories upon victories upon victories upon victories that came as a result of even, you know, and during the time of Umar's Khilafah, the victories were expanded exponentially. Okay, so this was like the beginning opening door of victory. إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ Now Allah here is uh, saying, وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَةً And you saw with your own eyes the people entering into Islam in big, big, big numbers. So here, وَرَأَيْتَ is telling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you will see with your own eyes. And you, see, you will see with your own eyes people. And this is really... Good news for the Prophet ﷺ that you know how sometimes you, you have a vision and you struggle for it but you don't see the fruits of it? Allah is giving good news to the Prophet ﷺ. You will see the fruits of this victory with your own eyes when the people enter into this deen. And afwaja, what does afwaja mean? Group after group after group. And literally this is what happens. Tribe after tribe after tribe were entering into Islam in big, huge, huge numbers. And... Um, وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ So Allah is separating here victory from when people enter. This is a very important point for, for us to understand. Is that who was with the Prophet ﷺ when it came to victory? It was the Sahaba, right? Sahaba were with him. The people who struggled, the Muhajireen and the Ansar. These were the people who were, you know, contributed towards the Fatih. They were the hard-working people who supported the Prophet ﷺ in the early years. They were part of that mission. But then as a result of that, the fruits were what? People, Allah calls them an-nas. People, the, the normal people, they started entering into this deen in multitudes. So there's two groups here. There's people who worked for the vision, they were part of that mission, and there's people who entered into Islam after that mission was achieved. In a way here we're learning that Allah is honoring the people who worked for this mission and He's calling the people who came later Nas. They were just people. Okay? And, and we learn from Abu Bakr Sadiq Sira that a lot of these people, these Nas who came in multitudes, what happened to them after they entered Islam? They left also very quickly. Why? Because they, they, weren't, they didn't have that solid foundation. They entered in, in last left out first. A lot of them, you know, they ended up not paying zakat and they came up with this whole concept of let's not pay zakat. Some of them ended up, you know, claiming their profits also, you know? Literally, this is what happened. Yani. So, this is these people who came in later on, this is the, you know, not, not the, the solid foundation of believers who really started. So, here also, yani, for us living in times where you know, Islam is, is still growing, it's not you know, dominant in the world today. 
we also need to think about where we stand, right? Do we want to be, because see, the victory of Allah is going to come, the Khilafah of, of Allah is going to come, the Khilafah Ali Minhaj and Nabu, according to the promises of the Prophet, is going to come. Whether it's going to come in 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, 500 years, we don't know, right? It's going to come, it's going to come. But in a way, we need to, as believers, decide, do we want to be from the people who struggle for the mission, like the Sahaba did, like the Muhajirin and Ansar did, or do you want to be from the, the Nas who just, you know, ride the train when it's, yani, when things are nice and easy? You know, and what we're learning here is the majority will follow later on. And Nas means plural. But what about the Sahaba? They were few, right? The selected few, the people who struggled, they were few. The majority follow later on. Like the 80-20 rule, you've heard about the 80-20 rule? So 20% of the people will, will do 80% of the work. And then 80% will just follow along. They won't have much significance here. So this for us, should, this surah is actually a motivation. It should be a motivation for believers. I want to be from the people who contribute to the, towards the Nasr. I don't want to be from Nasa, Yadkhuluna Fi Deen Allah. Those were the, you know, that's the easy way in. I want to be part of the, the struggle, why? Because the reward there is more. Those are the people who contribute towards this. You know? Rather than just being, getting the easy ride. Okay? So that's, that's one, uh, one of the lessons of the surah. And, وَرَأَيْتَ fi يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا Allah said they entered into, is, into the deen of Allah in numbers. He didn't say, and they believed. Why? Allah is telling us that they entered into Islam which is the legal part of it, right? It's just the basic level of Islam. That's why, you know, they didn't really have the belief, the strong belief and the strong, you know, conviction that the Sahaba and the, you know, Muhajiri Ansar had. These were just people who followed later on. They entered into Islam. So, difference between Islam and Iman. Very important you know, thing to distinguish, you know. And, you know, in the Quran, Allah mentioned the ayah, قَالَتْ الْأَعْرَابُ amanna That the Arabs... The Bedouins, they claim that we believe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet said, قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا Tell them that they, you didn't believe, but you only accepted Islam. وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ And, and Iman has not even entered your heart. SubhanAllah. So there, there, Allah is saying that there's a difference between Iman and Islam, and there are certain people who are labeled Muslims, but Iman hasn't even entered their heart. You can't claim that you're a, a mu'min, just like that. It has to be in your heart. But legally, that's what Islam is here. So, another thing we have to understand is, yani, part of this, entering into Islam as a consequence of just inheritance and being labeled as Muslims, it's a very dangerous thing if you take Islam for granted, right? And that's why we see so many people leaving Islam today. And there's this big movement of people just having doubts about Islam and becoming atheist and rejecting part of deen. Why? Because the foundation is not there. So we have to يعني, never ever take Islam for granted. Never ever take Islam for granted. Um, another thing here is, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ الله. You know, that when the victory came, did it come, there, was there any shortcut in it? How many years of struggle did it take? About 20, 23 years of struggle, right? We're learning here uh, the lesson of patience in the surah. That, you know, struggle will come, but you got to keep doing the small things consistently over and over and over and over and over again. And then the Nasr of Allah will come. Nasr of Allah doesn't come with shortcut. People, uh, unfortunately, try to find shortcuts for it. It doesn't work that way. You know, Nasr of Allah will come, but it comes after struggle. But then the, the, the second part of this uh, surah, which is, فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ Now that the Nasr has come, what should you do, Ya Rasulullah? Allah tells him, he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّ فَا السَّبَبِيَّةِ As a result of that Nasr, what are you supposed to do? فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا 
ف- so let's, let's split this into three things. There's tasbih, tahmeed, and istighfar. Okay? So what is tasbih? Tasbih means to declare the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by, you know, saying subhanallah. And, and in declaring the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are basically not associating any, uh, you know, impurity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is above all impurities and therefore his name is always going higher and higher and higher and higher. That is what tasbih is. Um, and then bihamdi rabbika and, and thank Allah basically. Why thank Allah? Because he gave you victory. Be grateful unlike who? Unlike the Quraysh. And Allah here said bihamdi rabbika. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding the Prophet sallam that don't forget that these are the favors of your master. Don't forget this, these are the favors of your master. Remember, one of the ne- meanings of Rabb is the one who ke- keeps giving you gifts. So Nasr, in a way, here's the victory. And Surat Al-Kawthar also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hinted, inna atainaka al-Kawthar, victory was one of the meanings of a Kawthar, if you remember. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ So the, the, in terms of this part of the surah now, Allah is saying, first give Allah what He deserves, and then you ask what you want. What is Allah telling the Prophet to ask? For forgiveness. وَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا So, first you declare Allah's perfection, give Allah what He deserves, and then ask what you want. We learned this in Surah Al-Fatiha also, if you remember. First we said, الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين These are all praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, giving Him what He deserves. And then we ask Allah what? What we want, right? اِهْدِنَا الصَّرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ Help us, Ya Allah. That help and the seeking of guidance, that's what we need. When do we deserve what we ask for? When we give Allah what He deserves. Okay? So, فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ This is what Allah deserves. وَاسْتَغْفِرْ And then ask Him for what you want. Then you, um, you know, seek what you want to get. إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّبَ He is most definitely a tawab. So, Part of this istighfar, okay, why, why, why is Allah mentioning istighfar here? We understand tasbih and, and glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and declaring His perfection and tahmeed of, because of the victory. But why istighfar? What's the link between this and, and victory? Istighfar, part of it is humility. Part of it is humility. Ya Allah, I gain victory, but I'm still humble towards you. I'm still, you know, it's to put you back and give you that uh, humble check. That, Ya Allah, in front of you, I'm still a slave of Allah. And and the other beautiful thing here is that, you know, sometimes, even in good deeds, sometimes we, it's called taqseer. We we don't perfect things. Like, after salah, what are you supposed to do after salam? Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. You're supposed to say three times, astaghfirullah. Why? Because, Ya Allah, yes, we prayed, but... It's not 10 out of 10. You know, it's not a perfect salah, ya Allah. And therefore, with this istighfar, we complete. And of course, when you, when you praise the sunnah prayers, that's completing your prayer even more and more and more. You know, that's part of why you know, we're supposed to be praying sunnahs, inshallah, as, as the Prophet has recommended to us. Why? Because our, our fard salah is never perfect. To istighfar, to admit that there's shortcomings even in good deeds. Why else istighfar? Because we know from other places in the Quran where, you know, the Prophet ﷺ was being corrected over and over again. Not for mistakes, but just because of his high status. Like Abbasa wa Tawalla, if you remember this, right? These are all the situations. There's several other places in the Quran where, um, you know, the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches the Prophet ﷺ to aim higher and, and his standard is so much more higher. So istighfar is part of that also. And istighfar, we learn from istighfar also a beautiful thing about the idea that, and we just finished Ramadan, right? And we've talked about this in maybe in surat, tafsir of Surah Al-Qadr, that why do we do istighfar? Why do we seek tawbah? Because we want that clean slate so that we can start fresh and start building and start doing, doing great things, right? So part of istighfar here, Allah is teaching us that yani, it's not just from sins. Istighfar is for your sins So that Allah can forgive you from your sins But what after that? 
What after that? Does it end there? No, it doesn't end there. Now is the time for you to actually do great things. Go and aim higher. And remember, grow from one qadr to another to another qadr. But that tawbah and the istighfar is just like that motivation. So istighfar and tawbah is actually motivation. Allah has given us this tool to motivate us. That Listen, regardless of your past, don't worry about it. You know, I'm willing to delete everything you've done. You know, if you're willing to do good things. You know, so it's, a, it's really a beautiful way of looking at how Allah motivates us to istighfar. Istighfar is supposed to motivate us. And, you know, istighfar is also, like I've told you before, it's, it's, a t it's an auditing mechanism. When you do istighfar, you're actually auditing yourself. Where are my shortcomings, Ya Allah? You know? Whether it's in your, uh, you know, your, the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maybe you haven't fulfilled. Maybe it's your, your rights with your parents that you haven't fulfilled, so you're doing istighfar from that. Maybe it's, you know, shortcomings in your business or in your job, so you're doing istighfar from that. Maybe it's your relationship with your neighbors, your cousins, your family, you're doing istighfar from that. So istighfar from all different parts of your, or different roles of your life, where you're, you have shortcomings in that. إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا There is no doubt about it. He is Tawwab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Tawwab. This is one of his names, Al-Tawwab. The one who is willing to forgive you. The one who is willing to, you know, uh, forgive all your sins. And he's willing for you to come back to him. Tawwab means to literally go back to Allah. You know, after you've distanced yourself, you're willing to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what basically Tawwab means. And so here... You know, what we're learning here is that yani, victory sometimes can be a, a reason for someone to become arrogant, for someone to have an ego. And, you know, in this surah, Allah is teaching us that sometimes we have many victories in our life, right? Many accomplishments that you make, certain milestones in your life which, where you feel that, wow, I did this, I achieved this. I graduated, I got this job, I, I closed that deal. These many victories in our lives, these should be reminders for us to do such a shukr like the Prophet Sallallahu used to do. You know, in these moments, who are we supposed to revert to first? Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. Thank Him, do tasbih, do istighfar. You know, don't forget this. Because then shaitan comes and, and ego comes into, into play and this can be very, very dangerous. When we, you know, have these big accomplishments in our lives. So this, this surah is teaching us about this. That don't underestimate the role of tasbih and hamd and, and developing your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that it has an equal, uh, you know, equal role to play in your victories. Subhanallah. And, um, you know, we learned this also from Musa alayhi salam when he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send Harun with him. You know what he said? He said, Why do I want, Ya Allah, why do I want Harun to be with me? So that we can declare your perfection and we can remember you a lot. He didn't say send him with me because you know I stutter and he has a better voice than me and he's gonna we're gonna strategize together. What was the role of sending Harun with him? Subhanallah. So you know we're learning from even that incident that one of the, you know, tools of victory is tasbih and hamd and istighfar. Subhanallah. Because, yeah, you know, we, we tend to think about material reasons of victory, right? Allah is saying, you want victory? Declare my perfection. Thank me. وَلَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ And istighfar. Like Nuh السلام, also taught us, فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا When you do istighfar, Allah will send down, you know, rain from the sky and, and risk. And He'll give you children. وَيُمْدِدْكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ And He'll give you gardens. وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ أَنْهَارًا and rivers. You know, all from what? From istighfar. And we take, we take these things so lightly, you know. And we have to think about this when we, even after salah, right? Like, it's time to say subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, and you do istighfar. It's mainly lip service that we do, right? 
But here Allah is telling us, no, when we internalize these meanings, we internalize perfection of Allah, tasbih. When we internalize what, is, what it means to say alhamdulillah, when we internalize istighfar, it actually has a significant role in our victories in our, in our lives and in our accomplishments in our lives. It's such a big deal here. And, you know, we also learned here that um, someone like Musa alayhi salam, right? I mean, he spoke to who? On the Mount of Tur, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yani, we would expect him, you know, when you talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, would you want to end that conversation? <laughs> you don't want to end that conversation. And that's why we learn, you know, when, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Musa alayhi salam, so... مَا تِلْكَ بِيَمِينَكِ Musa. What's that on your right hand? You know? What was the, the appropriate answer to that question? My stick! Literally, the, the answer would be one word. But we learn from, uh, you know, that part of the Qur'an where the dialogue's happening. Musa alayhi salam goes on and talks on and on about his stick. This is my stick and I use it for, you know, for my sheep. And I sometimes, like, lean on to it. And Allah didn't ask him, what do you do with the stick? <laughs> He just asked him, what is that in your right hand? You know? But what, what we learn from that extended conversation that Musa Islam had with Allah is Musa does not want that conversation to end. Because it's such an amazing conversation with, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you want to just, you know, yani continue talking, yani don't let it end. And so here, what did, Musa, uh, what did Allah tell Musa Islam? Idhab ila Fir'aun. I know you're enjoying this conversation, but now it's time for you to go and do your work. Go. We have to end this conversation. Yes, you had yani, a conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is like one extreme of amazing conversation, the best conversation you can ever have. And now you're going to have the worst conversation with, with one of the worst people. Complete contrast, yani. So when you get used to talking to Allah, you want to stay, stay in, in, you know, in connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah is saying, no, but the, the mission is, now you get to talk. You got to talk to me, now you get to talk to the worst of my creation. This is your mission. And he has to do it. He can't say, no, ya Allah, can we talk for five more minutes? No, he has to go. So the Prophet sallam, similarly, you know, like he used to love the Qiyam al layl He used to love... قوم الليل إلا قليلا and فسبح 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 but فذكر was always there get up قوم فأنذر go and work and, and and listen to these cruel words being said to you and these insults and and all the prophets went through this I mean Nuh alayhi salam when he used to pr proclaim the message 950 years people literally used to stick their fingers in their ears and they used to like you know cover up their clothes Get out of my way, you know. The, I look at the insult that these uh, prophets had to go through just, just to proclaim that message. And so they would love to just talk to Allah. But Allah said, I know that you like that and you enjoy that, but the real work is still there. But what, what we learned, like I told you before, uh, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, now that your mission's over, فَسَبَّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ Now you can spend the la last part of your years uh, in, in the tasbih and ham hamd. And that's why before even uh, passing away, the Prophet ﷺ was asked, right? Do you want to go back to Allah? And, and he said, بَلِ الرَّفِيقَ الْأَعْلَى بَلِ الرَّفِيقَ الْأَعْلَى That yes, I want to go to my rafiq, literally, like my companion or my friend, the one who's most high, subhanAllah. So the mission is done. Now you do what you like. Now you do what you enjoy doing. Do continue doing dhikr and tasbih. And um, what else can we say? Yeah, we need to be careful about you know um, you know how we think about uh, the Prophet Sallallahu istighfar, right? I mean, it's not like our mistakes. And you know, uh, a nice example of this is someone who like continuously misses. Fajr, right? Someone who, let's say for, he hasn't prayed Fajr for like five years, right? But one day, Allah guides him and he comes to Fajr, he's at the second rakah. Is he going to be happy that he made it? 
he's going to be ha happy. Now compare this person to someone who has been praying five years continuous, like, you know, he's there uh, right after Adhan and he's doing his dhikr and Quran. If he comes late, how is he going to feel? He's going to feel that his yani, worship was less than usual, right? But compare the two now. One person hasn't prayed for him. This is like an amazing accomplishment, but for the other... It's like a shortcoming, yani, subhanAllah. And you know, we hear how some of the Sahaba, they used to react in missing Fajr. Just a side note here. For some people, uh, they say that missing Fajr was like the death, uh, death of a family member. That is how tough it was on them. Yani. And nowadays, like, people miss Fajr like it's like, yani, you know, Adi, yani. it's okay, I'll make it up. Yani. For them, it was such a big thing that they would feel like a family member was lost. Just try to remember the last time someone in your family, a close family relative died. Yeah. How devastating it is and how messed up your mood is. That's how we should feel when Fajr is missed, subhanAllah. So, um, again, this surah, uh, yeah, to, to, to wrap it up, is teaching us about an attitude of a believer, right? That he's humble. He has a strong connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the same time, he has the hope of victory. But the, the, that goal does not distract us from the real purpose, which is to purify ourselves. Right? You purify yourself and the victory will come. Don't focus so much on the victory and forget your salah, forget your purification. Constantly think about yourself. And you know, wallahi, I think that yani, we're living in times where this is like a golden opportunity uh, for believers, especially the youth, you know, that Islam is, is on a rise now, right? There's no, there's no doubt about it. And so, yani, you could be one of three people. Either you are joining in, you're doing something, Right? You're being part of this movement, you're being active, you're, you're getting on the train like they say. Or you could be behind the scenes and you're just watching and you're like saying, MashaAllah, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Tabarakallah, right? And you're watching videos of amazing things happening and you're just like liking and sharing and talking about it while eating pakore and samosa, you know? So you're just an audience. You're not in the game, you're just sitting in the audience. Or number three, you don't even know. What's going on? You're, you're like on a completely wrong track. But yeah, this surah gives us hope that yani, Nasr is going to come, whether we like it or not. It's just a matter of time. But it's up to us whether to ride on the train or to sit back or to do something that has no clue with or has nothing to do with this victory. You know? There's literally three groups of people here. And this, so this is like an opportunity of a lifetime. We have literally the, um, the same opportunity that literally the Sahaba had, you know, in the sense of, you know, think of this like Meccan period where, you know, you have like system B and, you know, all these different fitnas going on and people are, and Islam is being suppressed. For you to hold on to your deen is like the Meccan period time, right? Tough times. Yeah. So if you have that honor and that opportunity to... to be close to Islam and be someone who is actively involved in, in this work and actively, you know, you want to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you want to understand this book and you want to have a vision that's going to help you, inshallah, earn your jannah, then inshallah, you will be, inshallah, rewarded with, uh, you know, very huge, huge rewards because you are being unlike the majority. You're deciding to be just like those strangers. Just like the Sahaba were in the earlier years strangers, you, you are willing to be the stranger. You're, be, you're willing to be the odd one out. You know, in the Prophet said, فَطُوبَ لِلْغُرَبَى and, and good news, there's a special tree in Jannah called Tuba for who? For those who are strange. And, and we're living in those times now. People who, wake, yani, especially young people who wake up for Fajr, you're considered weird. Young people who spend, like, listen to a Quran dars, Considered weird. Young people who lower their gaze, you're considered weird. Right or no? Right? And, and so because of peer pressure and just society and, and some parents actually, yeah, subhanAllah, they 
they come and tell me, that, listen, I, I'm going to send my kids to you, but don't make them too Islamic. Yani. <laughs> yani, I don't want them too, too Islamic. Be careful. Yani. <laughs> so um, yeah, this is uh, really the test. Yani, you know? And Surat al-Nasr teaches us uh, and gives us hope that this, is, this victory is coming and you know, it's an open invitation. You want to be from the Nas who will come later on or you want to be from those who really take advantage of it from the beginning. So inshallah with that we conclude and inshallah next uh, surah we'll look at how this was a surah about the victory of the believers. Next surah, Surah Al-Masad, we'll look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what is the fate of the disbelievers with the classic story of Abu Lahab and his, his wife. So barakallahu li wa lakum, subhanakallahu wa bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa ant, nasafiru kama tubu ilayk, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.